I thought it was especially appropriate that this one meant um, harvesting, harvesting the fruits. Um, this is actually a theme, the, the way the event is progressing is kind of that we planted seeds on the first day and we're, we're going to be doing a lot of harvesting of that today. And we're going to be talking about literal harvesting, harvesting of water um, during our food, land, and water session later. And I wanted to just give a quick framing of the event for, um, for everybody who wasn't here yesterday. So this is the first Living the New Economy Convergence in Oakland, which I'm really excited about. Um, but it is not the first in the world. It started in 2012 in Vancouver, Canada. And by a woman named Nicole Moen, who, who hosted it twice in Canada, and then it just sort of exploded into the world. And now there's th this year and next, there's over 25 cities hosting an event like this worldwide. And, and so we're sharing some of the same kind of ethos and, and what does the new economy mean. Um, but we're also going to be sort of discovering that today, and, and we did yesterday largely too. We, we opened. Uh, yesterday we had some really great speakers. Um, we talked about the big picture, um, synchronicity and gifts in the new economy, and uh, going deep with each other and giving gifts and to collaborate. We talked about how how money is at the center of that and the transactional nature that we've all become accustomed to in interactions with each other and as well as how the design of the money we use affects us in everyday life. And then um, we talked about equity and justice and inclusivity in the new economy and who was in the room and who was not in the room. And we explored both all of that later in the day with our tracks on um, mon alternative money and finance, justice in the new economy, and new business models. So that was really rich and I, I couldn't have been happier with everyone who spoke yesterday, um, and I, I think there was just great discussion going on. If you weren't here, please check out the, um, there's some prompts that people wrote on the sticky notes. Um, there's also a place on your name tag to fill in kind of what you'd like people to ask you about. So we're, we're really trying to keep the conversation going here, especially leading up to the end of today where we're all going to close together and share um, out a lot of the things we learned and some of the intersections and the collaborations between these groups that don't often talk to each other. People in food, people in money, people in social justice. Uh, so I, I don't want to go too much into the stuff I said yesterday since a lot of you are here, but I did just want to um, acknowledge everybody who's helped make this happen yet again. Um, all the small businesses that donated, uh, all the candidates and the mayor for coming today, and all of you for just being great and showing up on time. Um, and we're going to stay on time today. Uh, please don't be offended by our bell ringing and our time signs in the back. Um, we, we're, you have a hard stop time today, and we, we really want to give everyone a chance to share. Um, there's also going to be somebody taking photos today and asking uh, for you to maybe answer a question about what's coming up for you or what what new economy means to you with, with that whiteboard over there And um, if you're if you're willing we'd love to have that just for <coughs> Our social media and for us to capture and see what you guys are, are thinking after this event And I also wanted to point out one change on the schedule um, which is that uh, Mapping the landscape also includes Ann Griffith and Robbie Clark uh, apologies left those people off and they're going to be in the Laurel Room and the other session, Action for Equitable Access, is actually going to be in the Uptown Room. So we'll remind you of that no, as it's I'm sorry, can I clarify? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's that the, the speakers, the wrong speakers are associated with the session title. So um, Danielle will be um, speaking for Mapping the Landscape, Where Are We Now and How Did We Get Here? And that is happening in the Uptown Room. And then um, Sasha Junius um, and also Ann Griffith and Robbie Clark will be speaking on a panel, uh, Action for Equitable Access, and that will be happening in the large room. So I apologize for the discrepancy, and I'm going to put signs outside the rooms to help clarify that as well. And just a, a couple of quick reminders. Um, I'm going to tell you this again this evening, but there's a party tonight at Impact Hub Oakland down the street at 2323 Broadway. And um, we'd love for you to join us there. Everybody who has a ticket is, is welcome to come. And uh, it's also open to the public. And it's, it's just for fun. We've, we've made you listen and work and think uh, for two days. And we really want you to come.
just meet everybody else who's excited about these things and have a good time. So that's 6.30 to 11 tonight. And then there's a hackathon over the weekend uh, where we're going to get into project teams and actually form groups and, and projects around some of these ideas that we've discovered today. And I think there's a few spots open still for that, um, which is happening at 101 Broadway. So this is a big four-day event really designed to take inspiration to action. And I'm really glad you're all here being part of it. And I'm going to hand it over to Angela Seven, one of our core organizers, who's going to lead us into the first panel. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Thanks, Kendra. Okay, welcome. Um, so my name is Angela Seven, and I am a co-director of a program uh, called Pathways to Resilience, uh, which is a re-entry program for those uh, re-entering our communities uh, in Alameda County. And it is a holistic program that also includes a so social enterprise component and a permaculture values uh, curriculum, as well as healing and restorative justice circles over the course of about four to five months. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, and I'm going to imagine all of you dancing uh, because this is something that I don't, I, I'm not really, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so welcome and um, really great to meet you. Uh, this is Gail McLaughlin, who is the mayor of Richmond. Courtney Ruby, who is candidate for mayor of Oakland. And also city auditor. And Dan Siegel, who is also candidate for mayor of Oakland. And is a lawyer. And also worked in the government of uh, Oakland City. So, um, I did a little research, and really, um, and you all sent a, a sort of an opening, and I'm going to read that so everyone has a kind of refresher, a reminder of what, you know, what we want to talk about today. So, um, and I also, um, there's other cities that are really looking at this new economy question um, in terms of economic development, in terms of shared values, and how to create uh, a new economy that works for everyone, and maybe it's not new. That's something that came up yesterday in some of the discussions. So I'm just going to read something here from the New Economy Campaign of Pittsburgh. <coughs> the new economy is being used lately to describe economic development that focuses on shared value creation for the business owners, the employees, and the host community and the environment rather than the distressed sinking ship of extracting value from the same. It is business practices and economic policies that make you and I, our communities, and the earth really matter. Another way to say it, it is the economy of the future, and some might say weaves the strengths of the past. One where economic success means fair and equitable benefits, one that uses of financial, social, and environmental resources efficiently, and where business activity replenishes our environment. The concept of shared value can be defined as policies and operating practices that enhance the competitiveness of a company while simultaneously advancing the economic and social conditions in the communities in which it operates. Shared value creation focuses on identifying and expanding the connections between societal and economic progress. So some of the questions that we'd like to address, uh, and I would like to give each of you five minutes to just cover what you know what's coming up for you. And I'm sure you've prepared some things as well. And so these are some of the things that we asked them to, um, to address, which is what are some local, new, innovative, Econ economy policies that you want to publicize? And how can local activists work with you to adapt to changing economic and ecological realities? And how would you bring about policy changes that would enable equitable structures to emerge? What can local government do to facilitate and support 
such ground up initiatives. Chevron's multi-million dollar attacks 
on progressive candidates. I'm terming out as mayor this year, but running for city council to keep the transformation going. Chevron has spent three million plus dollars, which is unprecedented, to try and defeat the progressive direction. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders was recently in Richmond uh, and uh, supporting Team Richmond, which is the slate I'm running on, saying that we have to continue the fight back of, uh, to prevent Chevron from buying our elections. So his, you know, truly democracy is at stake here. They not only pollute our air, but they pollute our elections. Mm -hmm. So we're working very hard. Richmond is truly ground zero. Um, if we continue, and I totally believe we will, to fight back on them in spite of all the attacks they're putting out there on, on good candidates, um, we will showcase that a community can define its own destiny and there will be rippling effects for other cities. So we want to keep this progressive work going. We call on all of you to keep working as you are and to support Richmond in our struggle. And uh, together we're going to shift the, uh, the forces in our society to showcase that the community, the truly those most in need, the, the average person, the 99% are the ones who are in control and who will make a difference in our society. Thank you. So good morning, I'm Courtney Ruby, and I'm the elected city auditor of Oakland and a mayoral candidate. And I'm just gonna bring my perspective today. I'm really honored to be invited and kind of give you a little bit of a background about how, I'm, how an accountant uh, you know, is here today and what that means to the new economy. Um, and so a little bit about my background. Uh, I got into politics because I made a decision between politics and ministry. And I made the decision for politics because I believe that I could affect a greater number of people's lives by being in politics. So what you're talking about today with bringing forth a new economy and having the equity that we're really able to create an economy that works for all. And, you know, by being an accountant because that is, you know, this is where I can bring my gifts. Um, and looking at the path of my life, it's very interesting to be spiritual and to be on this path and to end up being a CPA. <laughs> so, but I trust the process. And I trust that when I became the elected city auditor eight years ago, and I started down a path of creating ethics in government, of really striking at the ethical core and looking at what doesn't work. And everything that we're talking about in this conference is about putting forward policies that work, but we need to have that basic government structure that works. So that's what I've been doing for eight years is trying to identify how do we get the basic structure to work? Because when we deliver the basic structure and we deliver public safety, then we're able to put forth the policies of equity and have it work. So things that come up for me when we look at local government is the when proposals are put out and the same companies get the proposals over and over again. That's not a government that serves the people, right? So if we have systems <coughs> in place that actually allow for the compliance, ensuring that people are applying for those fair, then we start to bring forth the people who really want to bring change. And what I've heard over this campaign, and certainly as auditor, is people don't want to put forth proposals here because they don't fair, feel that they're getting their, their fair shake in this. So we've got to be able to change those systems where the systems are no longer broken and they're working. When so it comes to back to you know who is who is government serving? Is it serving those who have the money? You know we certainly can talk about campaigns because with campaigns you know it requires a lot of money, right? And it's very interesting and, and ranked choice voting. That's we're not talking about that today, but it brings forth you know who has the money. And with government, it's the same as far as developing. We're in a critical place right now of developing how Oakland will be. And as I looked forward on, you know, just preparing for today, I just want to uh, read one quote. This is from a, a study on the future of state and local economic development policy. And it says that we believe that the greatest efforts in economic development characterized as those that engage workers' wisdom and wealth in the crafting 
and the execution of development efforts should be dedicating towards making communities a better place to live so when i look at delivering the basics of a safe and well-run city making sure that we have an effective police department and i spoke to chief magnus in richmond because he's been able to do that and when we bring there's a lot of discussion about policing but just the baseline safety let's just talk about public safety that when we have a safe a safe city then we're able to increase our development when we have a government that plays by the rules we're able to increase our development in in an equitable way because people are participating and want to participate and trust that the system is going to work but if the system is rigged or is broken then there isn't that guarantee another part of when we look at oakland so as as reporting out for eight years that our systems are challenged is understanding that when we have a system of public government that is not working as well as it could in providing public services that that increases the uh it says some places can survive with poor local government but it requires an astonishing effective set of amenities so this again goes to the baseline of having good schools having a safe environment having a health and well-being in our community that those are all things that government needs to be supporting that we're delivering that and when we do our part which is why i'm in government then we can deliver a fair and equitable world that we're all striving for so with that i'll turn it over to you Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, I'm Dan Siegel. Um, I'm a recent candidate for Oakland as mayor and a long-term civil rights attorney, which is uh, what I've been doing for about 40 years. Um, it's really exciting to be here and uh, really exciting to be on the panel with Gail. Uh, the city of Richmond is the frontier between the new and old economies. And to the extent to which we can help out, I think we all should. So in, in thinking about what to say today, I, I was thinking, well, start with the old economy. What is the old economy? In, in scope, it's international. It's dominated by international corporations. It's based on a single value, which is maximizing profit. And its impacts are growing inequality, financial and political hegemony. We see Citizens United. I'm always fond of telling people, when I was a kid, my father showed me an article which said that 5% of the population controlled 20% of the wealth. Uh, I was horrified. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the New York Times told us that 3% uh, of the U.S. population controls 44.5% of the wealth. And I think if you want to understand what's going on in this country, that tells it all. So what about the new economy? To me, the new economy, first of all, in scope is based on local human scale activity it has many more values protecting the environment income equality people's needs human equality good schools good housing so on and if it's not actually explicitly anti-corporate it's extra corporate it's something that's going to exist outside the world economic and banking system at least for now and what should its impacts be its impact should be living wages and benefits for all people. That's why I've made the $15 minimum wage a cornerstone of my campaign for mayor. It needs to fight for social, racial, and economic justice. And it needs to be about protecting the environment, protect, protecting our home. So let me give you some examples that uh, I, I think should be part of an agenda for Oakland based on principles of the new economy. First of all, I support the idea of creating stronger and larger worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, the Cleveland model, which is led by Gar Alperwitz, is uh, employing hundreds of people to provide services such as greenhouse services, laundry services, to big institutions. I'd love to do that in Oakland. I'd like to take it a step further and have create a co-op to make Oakland an all-solar city, 100% solar city, which is 
financially very possible these days, given tax breaks and other ways in which we can install solar panels and hire hundreds of people at $25 an hour, which is the going salary, to install panels all over the city. In Oakland, I think an important step for democratic financing, and by the way, we've been victimized incredibly by interest rate swaps that we've kind of been sucked into by the Wall Street banks. I want to create a Bank of Oakland, yeah. modeled after the Bank of North Dakota, which protects our local economy and allows our funds not only to be kept locally, but to be used for local priorities, such as funding co-ops or funding people's ability to stay in their homes. I think another example is democratic access to the internet, another new technology. Uh, again, borrowing the model of Chattanooga, Tennessee, which has created a municipal internet service provider, which creates super high-tech cabling, so it helps bring in uh, high-tech businesses. But to me, more importantly, it creates a democratization of the internet. Its costs for the average person are lower than what you now pay to AT&T or another company, but even better, it can provide free services to people who are in economic need. And we talk a lot about bridging the internet divide. That's one way in which to do it, is by providing free internet service to people. Uh, another example, uh, and I know people talked, I think yesterday, about the uh, land trust, the Trust for Public Land. I want to create an urban land trust in Oakland, which would take title to underutilized publicly owned land, as well as a part of the land that big developers want to use to create uh, market rate housing and build housing that's affordable for people with moderate incomes. We can build at least 10,000 units in Oakland of modular housing that sells for sixty to $100,000, keep it in the land trust perpetually, and therefore have some impact on the growing tide of gentrification. Yeah. And then the last thing, which is uh, underway in Oakland, but which I think deserves and needs public response, is the development of food production. And we have lots of urban gardens. We need more. We have an example of uh, Fat Beats, which some of you I'm sure know about, in North Oakland, where the organization uses part of a park to grow food, to teach people how to farm, to establish some small cooperative businesses for marketing the produce, and has become a neighborhood social action public safety organization in the process. So we see ways in which this economic activity is helping to bring an entire community together and to make it safer for all the people who live there. participation in in government in any form is is progressive <coughs> and aligned with a lot of the values that people hold here um, and um, and I also want to look at how can government really specifically change you know structurally and um, you know one thing that comes up is um, there's a participatory budgeting it's an innovative democratic process that gives community members the chance to directly decide how to spend a portion of a public budget. So it is relatively new in the U.S. and um, and the White House has actually already recognized participatory budgeting as best practice of civic engagement. In California, participatory budgeting is already happening in Vallejo, San Francisco, Long Beach, and will be starting in Los Angeles in 2015. So just want to um, look into that. How would you describe, um, for you, Gail, um, your efforts to bring participatory budget to Richmond? And would you continue to, to fight for that? And, and are there opportunities um, to start that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have brought forward proposals. I brought forward a study session to the city council, met with the folks in the Bay Area, as well as the national um, group that uh, is part of this participatory budget process, or I guess it's called participatory budget project. And um, what we did, uh, the, the votes weren't there on the council, which is why we need to make sure we have 
fully a progressive majority, true progressives on the council. Um, but what I was able to do was uh, we did a, my office sponsored a youth summit this year and um, we had one of the workshops, the two different main workshops were to create a youth council, which we have since created, and also to create a participatory uh, budgeting process for youth to educate them and to start thinking about doing um, a participatory budgeting process that allows youth only to weigh in on how the city should spend a certain segment, yes, an allocated pot of money for youth programs and, and youth um, priorities in the city. So the youth learned a lot about that. Um, we, again, have not yet had the, the, um, the amount of uh, support on the city council, but I do see it as something that we will have come January when the new council gets uh, sworn in after being elected. Um, and I see this, and I talked to the White House actually, the person involved reached out to me and she heard we were pushing this uh, youth piece of participatory budgeting. So we think it's uh, um, something that we can definitely you know, allocate a certain portion of our budget and yet the youth weigh in precisely on what they need and then of course they uh, give their um, priorities to the city council and we would hopefully all um, move forward with, with their um, recommendations. City staff participates, ed experts participate. So it's a process of uh, what is feasible and what is desired by the community. So I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Courtney and Dan, how would you uh, work to bring participatory budgeting to Oakland? I think that it's critical that we have people that are engaged. It's the engagement process. And I think that if people feel left out of the equation, then we don't have that investment. So bringing that participation in the participatory budgeting, also looking at survey. Like I think your, your leaders really need to know what your concerns and what your priorities are and how we're doing this together. And having been in government, so prior to being elected city auditor, I was also the chief financial officer for the Department of Human Rights in the state of Illinois. And the budgeting system is, it, you know, I'm, uh, I know broken, you know, is a word that you hear a lot from me, but it's a part where we haven't, government hasn't caught up to where we are. And we've got to reconstruct it. And that's why it's important to have people inside government being able to reconstruct how the process works. So when we look at how we're spending our money and the, the idea of participatory budgeting is making sure that your government does represent you through the intentions. And we've got to have people on the council, you know, as Gail said, wanting to move that forward. We have got to have a mayor wanting to move that forward. But then you also have to operationalize it. And I think that that's where, you know, the two parts of where I go is like, it's one thing bringing them policy, right? But then how do we implement it so that it is actually successful to get the results? Because I feel a lot of times government moves forward on the policy end, but they don't do the administrative end because they're not talking to how to do that. So that's where, where we bring real change in Oakland is when we make the systems support what the people want and the transparency and accountability. And Oakland has been really working on open data but they haven't been working on the part where we're really listening and, and then taking the priorities and putting that out in the community. Yeah. I think sometimes we have uh, new terms for older processes. Um, so I was thinking in response to this question, 20 years ago in Oakland, when L.U. Harris was mayor, um, we created something called Oakland Sharing the Vision which was a citywide strategic planning process. And we literally involved thousands of people in this process. We would have meetings at uh, the Kaiser Center where 1,000, 1,500 people would show up. We divided up into uh, task, task forces and discussed issues, public safety, education, economic development, housing, arts and culture. And some great ideas and proposals came out of that including Oakland's community policing plan, a plan to create small autonomous schools within the public school system, uh, a proposal to deal with blight created by liquor stores and others. And I think we need to look at models like this where we can involve many, many people from the community in discussing not only the budget, but other aspects of 
municipal policy and have a mechanism for actually implementing the ideas that come out of the process. Um, the sad story uh, with respect to Oakland sharing the vision was that when uh, Jerry Brown became mayor, uh, he cut off the public involvement and designated a room in City Hall as the Office for Innovation. After not too many months, that office was closed. <laughs> Thank you for that history. Um, so um, I want to go a little, little deeper here and um, because um, I'm recognizing that um, sitting here, myself, a, a resident of Oakland and um, in a position of, of privilege um, as a white person, um, that a, a lot of what I see in Oakland, that there are a lot of barriers and in the, the men that I work with uh, at San Quentin and the men and women who are in our program here in Alameda County um, have uh, criminal records and they're coming back into our community. And along with that criminal record comes uh, stigma, barriers to employment, and um, you know, there's just a lack of organizing work around the issue of joblessness. And I actually, um, there's some really great examples of um, how to deal with this. Uh, there's an article in resilience.org and they have Marissa who was interviewed this uh, a young man named Aaron Tanaka who brought uh, some legislation to actually um, prevent, uh, it took out their criminal record from the employment process. And it's similar to Ban the Box, but I have also heard from formerly incarcerated people that Ban the Box is nice and it's great, but it still hasn't, is, you know, there's still a long ways to go in terms of um, how to deal with this crisis of joblessness for people, not just people who have uh, been incarcerated, but it is a product of a racist and classist economy that has developed over these years. So, um, and I just want to know how can we look at that deeper as, as uh, in our governmental structures in accessing things. And also just for instance, Dan, you spoke about the park, uh, Dover Park, I've been there, and I know Fat Beats, um, they actually did that part somewhat without permission from Oakland city government. And they, you know, did a great thing and then, you know, got permission later. And that's a lot of how things have to be done. And so, uh, you know, cooperatives and things like that. So uh, how, how can we make these great ideas more accessible? Okay, so um, Richmond has um, a majority people of color community. We have um, nearly 40% Latinos and about 27% African Americans, about 13% um, Asian, and the remainder uh, is Caucasian and some Native Americans. So we um, have a very, very diverse community, and that uh, truly is our strength. Um, the way that we overcome these injustices, and um, in particular the injustices of um, the uh, prison culture that has imprisoned predominantly in large um, numbers uh, people of color, is to provide for reentry programs uh, when people come out. We do have a ban the box um, ordinance in Richmond. The box is no longer on our city applications, nor is it on our vendors that uh, do business with the city of Richmond. We have a groundbreaking ordinance that uh, says that this box that says, have you ever been imprisoned, um, is um, is eliminated from, from that application, or they can't do business with the city of Richmond. And the city of Richmond's application, except for public safety jobs, does not have that, have you ever been convicted of a felon. Uh, this is one step in the right direction, but you're right, it's not, um, it's not nearly enough. What we have, and part of the effort here, I think, is to talk about how elected officials can work with the community in a partnership. Um, what we have is a mobilized community that made sure that AB 109 money that came from the state, this is money from, um, from the state for this realignment of uh, the criminal justice system, um, comes into counties. And the sheriff of our county, Contra Costa County, wanted to use that money to expand the jail, to build another jail. The community organized big time. Uh, I supported them. Um, many, a couple other, actually one other elected official in Richmond was there at, at the many rallies and pushed and pushed and pushed. 
led by a really strong community effort. The sheriff changed his mind. Our police chief was on the side of the community. He changed his mind. The money, instead of coming to build a new jail, is coming into the city and the county for reentry programs. So we've been working on it. Yes, it's a great, really a great showcase of how the community mobilized can make a difference. And so now we are working on a one-stop welcoming center. We have a group called Safe Return Program. When people return into Richmond from being incarcerated, this one-stop center will refer them to whatever their needs are, whether it's job training, housing, substance abuse programs, something that keeps them moving in a supported direction after they come out of prison. And I know this is important. I visit San Quentin on a regular basis. There's a project in there called the Richmond Project. And these men are phenomenal in learning how to transform their lives while they're in prison. We want them to keep having that support when they come out so that they don't end up, you know, a statistic in terms of recidivism. So I really am, this is a key thing in Richmond. We want to keep providing opportunities for all. Those formerly incarcerated are part of our community. They deserve, you know, every chance to move forward in their lives. And that means a local government has an obligation, in my view, to help them have every chance to move forward. So we're working on that very, very diligently. So local government absolutely has a role, and we've got to make sure and ban the box. And then also the organizations that are using those funds right now to help those who have been previously incarcerated, that it goes back to the statement I said in my opening comments, are these organizations being held accountable? Because what we know is the other piece of the equation is we've got to make sure that when we have those dollars out there and we have programs that they're effective, and at the end of the day, they translate into jobs. And so that's where the accountability is really important, that we've got to use every dollar needs to be invested in transforming somebody's life. And when we are talking about Oakland, you know, I think Oakland has an incredible story to tell the nation that our diversity is our strength, just like Gail said with Richmond. And the fact of the matter is that 40% of our African-American boys are not graduating, and 60% go on to touch the criminal justice system. So that we have got to be driving systemic changes, and we need to be reporting out on the progress that we're making. And I think that that goes from moving the conversation to action. And then when we take action, are the organizations that are really supposed to help get our kids jobs, get those formerly incarcerated jobs, are they working? We know that there's a lot of workforce and development dollars in the state that could be coming to Oakland. So we've got to make sure that we're attracting those dollars and that we're using them wisely. Along, I am a proponent of strategic planning, that we've got to make sure that we have a plan for who the jobs right now, the employers, making sure that we are producing residents that are job ready, so that we know that we're attracting the best employers here, that they have the workforce that they need, and it's 3, 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And that when we're looking at those who are most challenged, that we are talking about case management, we are talking about mental health services, that we're really looking for the nonprofits that are successful in developing the whole person to go forth and be able to stabilize their own lives, but ultimately that stabilizes the Oakland, that stabilizes us together as a community. You know, the school to prison pipeline is not just a slogan, it's reality. And I've really been on a tear about the Oakland schools recently, thinking of what is it about the current system that maintains class and race divisions in the United States. We have a school system in Oakland, which I'm sure isn't different from that in many cities, where literally, literally 60% of the kids who show up in kindergarten are not prepared for kindergarten. And half of those who actually make it to high school graduate within four years. What happens to the other half? 
You can go to Department 11, the Alameda County Superior Court, any day of the week and see a dozen to 20 primarily African American and Latino young men get sent off to prison. Unless we deal with that education issue and deal with the public schools, we're not going to have a new economy. We're just going to maintain the old economy. So that's a big point of intervention and early childhood is critical. In terms of the incarcerated, you know, I've gotten to know the worst of the worst over the last couple of years. That's Jerry Brown's term, not mine. But talking about the, the people in solitary confinement, uh, my wife and I have been involved in this litigation to try to win solitary confinement in California. And I've met very few people who I think deserve to be in prison, who need to be in prison to protect us all. And so we need to get them out of prison. We need to put them to work. Uh, again, I, I have a vision, an idea of this co-op created for and by the recently incarcerated that's hired to paint schools and other public buildings around the city that creates decent blue collar jobs for people. The other thing about the city's role in all this is the city of Oakland, and I'm sure many other cities, has a lot of unused authority. It has the authority to dictate the terms on which it will grant permits for people to build ballparks, to build luxury housing, to develop the port, to develop the army base, and it should use that authority to require the jobs go to Oakland residents, and particularly those who need the most, the recently incarcerated. That's one way in which a city can actually use the power it already has to address some of these issues. Um, just one word about farms. Uh, not only fat beets, but just a couple of months ago, some people who live in East Oakland uh, developed a totally ratty vacant lot that was owned by the city of Oakland, put in flowers and vegetables there, and within about a month received an eviction notice from the uh, city of Oakland. Um, we were able to back them down, but that's obviously exactly the wrong approach. We want the city to be promoting the use of underutilized space for community gardens, not fighting them. I believe we have about 10 minutes left, and I know we have some burning questions out here. So um, I, I do have, um, I think I have one, one little comment, and, and maybe just something to put in the, in the air, um, is how these, that issue particularly um, is tied into gentrification because um, I know uh, several people who have returned to Oakland uh, from after being incarcerated for 16 years, and, and uh, they have no access to, to any housing, and that's the first thing. Uh, so it's not even, you know, he said, I don't need a job, I need a place to live. And the only way that he could get into a place to live was to um, be part of a, a, a substance abuse uh, home um, because he, he didn't have any other options, he didn't have that issue. But he is actually a restorative justice practitioner and wants to start his own type of house that is based on restorative justice values. So, I mean, think ideas like that coming from these people who have actually San Quentin provides a lot of great training for people to actually do some of these wonderful things out in, the, in their communities. So, but we need to provide a place for them to land. I'm just, just saying. <laughs> I have a question. Um, as you guys know, I mean, the, the tripling down theory is a fraud, right? It's actually a up. Yeah. Yeah. As a result, <laughs> as a result, basically money just leaves our local community, goes to the one percent, and it leaves everything devastated. Local businesses are closing down, we're losing jobs, and foreclosure, and all that. And as a result, all over the world, there's all these local currency popping up, right, to address this problem. Because then, with the local currency, this is not something that Wall Street banks can. Can, can suck out. It always resurfaces locally, it just never leaves a local situation. Um, and the greatest example probably is the Bristol Pound in the UK, where the mayor himself takes his salary in the local currency and is working actively with the city itself to accept local taxes in the local currency as a way then to encourage everyone in the local community to accept the local currency for it to circulate. And then you get a, a local economy that's vibrant that is insulated from the craziness in Wall Street. And um, of course, this, this we, we made us organize a conference and we are very invested in trying to get this kind of scheme working here too in the Bay Area. 
And I would love to ask all our panelists, I mean, would you be willing to work with something like Baybox to, to create a local currency in the community that will protect the local businesses and local residents? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the whole um, the whole movement toward a local currency is a wonderful idea. I would love to see it implemented in Richmond and would love to work with all those who are organizing and making that happen. That is um, precisely what we need, something to insulate us from the, uh, the predator, uh, predatory practices of Wall Street. That we need that insulation, that containment, that, that reinvestment in Oakland. So yes, I think it's a great idea. Also, uh, our friend uh, Wilson Riles Jr., some of you may know, uh, has been promoting this idea for years, but hasn't found uh, a champion at City Hall to help make it happen. Would you be that champion? I would. <laughs> <laughs> <Salary enough. laughs> Why not? The part of it I don't give back. I'd be happy to take it. Uh, thank you, John Key. Uh, a question over here? With respect to the um, reversal of some of the gentrification trends and preference for uh, projects that, that wouldn't be, wouldn't represent gentrification, um, would that potentially require accepting lower permitting fees um, for enabling such projects, and if so, uh, would that have, have an impact on city budget, and, and how would you address that? So I start, let me start on this one. You know, this is really a big challenge for us in Oakland, uh, in part because we don't have near enough revenue um, to fund the sorts of social services and other programs that I would like to see happen. And if you pay attention to the debates that are taking place regarding this mayoral campaign, um, it often boils down to, well, do you want to put the remainder of the city budget into hiring more cops so that there's no money for anything else? Or do you want to maintain the current budget where 15% is used for everything besides police, fire, and debt service? So. We, we cannot simply stop market rate housing. Market rate housing creates real estate transfer tax. People with moderate to high income uh, spend money in the city and generate sales tax revenue, all of which we desperately need. But at the same time, as I've said before, the idea of creating an urban land trust and making developers contribute to that with real estate, as well as using underutilized <coughs> land, is a way for us to create all sorts of housing for people. Um, not just home ownership for people who want to buy moderately priced homes, but uh, collective housing, perhaps for the recently incarcerated, for very poor seniors and others. And yes, the permitting fee should be non-existent for that. That should be the city's contribution to creating livable housing. With the affordable housing, we've got to make sure that we have enough market rate housing as well. So that's one of the things that's going on in Oakland is that there's not enough units at high, low, and high, medium, and low. So there's an Im the lack of inventory also has a, more of an impact on the affordable housing because people are taking affordable housing units that necessarily we could move them into a higher level. So you've got to make sure that we have a a full economic development plan when it comes to the level of having affordable middle and high income housing. And that is some of the, the nexus study that's going on right now at City Hall to determine the affordable citywide affordable housing policy. So determine the units and how many units we need. When we look at the revenues, as you know, Dan said, the city needs the revenues in order to be able to provide services. And we're in a, a position as a considered a medium to a small size business, a small size city of uh, half a, a million residents, that that is a, uh, a tough position for a city to really drive the level of revenues that we need in order to provide services. As we increase in population, and then we have more revenues. So it's really incumbent upon the policies that you're talking today about how do we how do we create that equity to make sure that we are spending our dollars wisely and that it is contributing to everyone. 
but we've got to, I am, you know, uh, uh, I do believe that we've got to create a safer city to bring more revenue here, to bring more employers here so that we have that revenue base so that we can do more for our current residents and that we have more dollars for affordable housing. So we've got to be able to strike a balance and how we strike that balance is with community engagement, making sure that we're developing the Oakland that we want, but addressing the issues of gentrification head on. So it's growing, but growing the city in the ways that we want. Um, so in Richmond, um, we have avoided gentrification thus far, and we're totally committed to avoiding it. Uh, we have um, among the uh, lowest um, rents uh, in their area, about 50% of our um, population rents. And so fair rent policies are very important. Um, we do not have a fair rent uh, or a uh, rent control pol ordinance. Uh, there haven't been the votes for it, but I would like to see that happen. Um, we also um, have uh, uh, land trusts have been an issue. We have a, a, a World War II um, housing uh, co-op in Richmond that we would like to see expanded. We would like to see scattered land trusts so that various vacant homes in different parts of the city could uh, be kind of, you know, built together as a network of, of a land trust. Um, we have um, a group called um, Troop, the Remember Us People Project, which is uh, started by a formerly incarcerated person who has some transitional houses. Um, we want to be able to provide housing for, for all our residents and affordable and fair housing. Um, we also have this social impact bond program that we're working on where uh, not only are we trying to avoid foreclosures, but with the CARES program, but we have been hit with foreclosures since 2007, big time, so we have a lot of vacant homes. And so um, this through the social impact bond, um, we're purchasing, um, actually a nonprofit is purchasing um, empty homes and um, remodeling, refurnishing, refurbishing them and selling them at affordable rate. So I would like to see some of these refurbished homes be uh, provided for the homeless. Um, I think that's uh, another important need in our community. So um, we really, art co-ops, uh, art live workspace, um, we really see Richmond as the place where a lot of artists are coming. We have a, a huge creative community. We want to showcase that we are a community where um, livable and fair housing is still available and we want to see other other cities um, do it as well. I know some of San Francisco and Oakland has already uh, moved in the direction of gentrification, but that could be reversed. So, thank you.
I just wanted to frame a couple more things and give a reminder to everybody else in the room. You know, yesterday we had some kind of bigger picture stuff, and we were talking about some interpersonal ways that the new economy affects us. And the second day, we're moving a little bit now into, like, nuts and bolts. And a lot of you are like, how do I plug in, and what do I do, and how do I join these things? So we're hoping to answer some of those questions, and these panels will really address some of the things you can get involved in and can carry that into the weekend with your own ideas and support projects here on the ground or start your own. So please, you know, move your money to a small bank. Community Bank of the Bay is out there. There's things you can do. You can sign up for Bay Bucks. You can sign up for Credibles. All this stuff you're hearing about is happening here and now, and we'd love for you to plug in and take action. And is there any other? Don't forget about the Friday night party if you leave us early. And that's it. Thanks to everyone. Where can we sign up for Bay Bucks? How do we sign up? There's a... Yeah, there's a sign-up sheet on the table right there at the entrance. First table you see. Okay, enjoy the last day of LNE Oakland 2014.